Parshas Emor has 124 verses and a staggering 56 mitzvot, nearly all of them relating either to the priests, the Kohanim, or to the festivals. And the Parsha ends with a very unusual episode that happened at Sinai. In fact, the entire book of Leviticus, there's very few narratives. Of course, we had the narrative of the death of the sons of Aaron during the week of inauguration. But the end of this Parsha tells a very unusual story that happened in the desert, in the wilderness, at the foot of Sinai. So the Parsha begins, Hashem said to Moses, Say to the Kohanim, say to the sons of Aaron, and tell them, you shall not contaminate yourself to a dead person amongst your people. The parsha begins with an instruction that a Kohen, a male Kohen, is not allowed to come into contact with dead people. Now, if you read this verse slowly, you'll notice that the word emor or amarta, the verb that tells us to go speak, to go go tell them, is repeated twice. And every time there is a verse in the Torah that you could have excised a word, Rashi invariably is going to ask, why does it say the word twice? So why does it say the word amar, amar, amarta, emor, that verb, speak to the children of Aaron? Why does it say it twice? And Rashi, of course, reveals to us the answer. So Rashi tells us that the reason why this is repeated twice is because once, go speak to the sons of Aaron, to the adults. And secondly, they should speak, they should convey this message to their children. There is an imperative not only for us to study the laws of the Torah, but also for us to convey those messages to teach them to our children. We have to educate our children. And this applies not only with the mitzvah of not coming into contact with dead people for the Kohen, but every mitzvah that exists, not only are we obligated ourselves to fulfill it, we have to pass that on. We have to convey that to our children. Now, incidentally, with respect to children themselves, the Rabban here tells us that even though we are not allowed to encourage our children to sin, but because they are not technically obligated until someone's an adult, they're not obligated themselves, therefore we may not need, or at least the Rabban says, that we don't necessarily need to prevent them in an active way from transgressing a sin. So for example, a a kid is about to flip the light on Shabbat. That's a transgression of the laws of Shabbat because they're not an adult and they don't really understand what's going on, even though we're we're supposed to encourage them to learn about Shabbat. And that's the mitzvah of of chinuch, of of education. And we cannot, of course, encourage that. But according to the Rabban, at least we would not be mandated to prevent them from doing that. Uh, others argue that because this lesson was told over here with respect to a Kohen not coming into contact with dead people, for a minor Kohen, meaning a, a Kohen who's not 13 years old, not an adult, there would be a responsibility for the parent to prevent them, to withhold them from coming into contact with dead people. Now, given that this is a principle in all of Torah, that we're encouraged to educate our children in the mitzvahs of the Torah, even though they're not yet technically obligated in fulfilling them. It's an interesting question that some of the commentaries ask. You know, the fact that the verb is repeated in this in this verse teaches us that we have to teach our children about, about Torah. But why specifically here, with respect to the Kohen, why specifically here are we given this insight to convey the lessons of the Torah to our children. So there's several answers to this question. Number one, we know that a Kohen, you know, they have an elevated status amongst the Jewish people. From the day that they're born, they know that they're different. There's a funeral, God forbid, right? Kohen can't go. There's a cemetery. Everyone could go to the cemetery. You can't go. You have to walk around with a degree of awareness of the fact that you're a Kohen and therefore you are different. Perhaps... It's apropos to convey a message of education broadly in the context of the Kohen. When we teach our children, okay, we're Jews and Jews do X, Y, and Z and Jews refrain from doing A, B, and C, we have to also convey this message. You're special. You're different. From day one, we're the Jewish people. We're part of the Almighty's chosen nation. We're a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We were chosen by God for a special mission to convey his existence to the world, and therefore we have the Torah. Just like the Kohen conveys that certain special message of who they are and their identity to their children. 
Alternatively, we could say that, you know, the Kohen has a tough. We read in this week's parsha all the laws related to the Kohen, who he can marry, who he cannot marry, where they could go, where they could, you know, they can't come into contact with a human corpse. And the Kohen may feel, you know, I am, I have all these undue requirements, responsibilities, and it is, it is difficult. And therefore, the word amar, which in all of Jewish literature is one of uh, connotes is a word that connotes pleasantness versus the word daber, which is more harsher. There's a double message of pleasantness. The Kohen should know, even though you have more restrictions, more obligations, but there's a degree of pleasantness that that can, that, that, that also is entailed with that. Your life will be more meaningful. It'll be more pleasurable even because of these restrictions because you have an elevated stature. Now, generally speaking, what is the meaning behind the idea that the Kohen and the Kohanic body, the, the tribe, cannot become impure, cannot come into contact with a dead body, with a cadaver? So the Chinuch, the Sefer Chinuch, which is the book, a medieval book that gives us the reasons uh, for, for the mitzvos, he says a very interesting idea. He says that we know a human is a hybrid. We're half animal, half angel. We got a body that's very similar to animalistic entities, species, and we have a soul that's akin to an angel. And in our existence over here, when we're alive, it's a fusion. It's a mixture. It's it's an amalgam of holiness from our angelic soul and mundanity from our animalistic body. Well, that's when someone's alive. What happens when someone dies? Well, their soul departs from them and all you have left is a body. And generally speaking, well, what's the body? The body is the seat of the animalistic component of man. So the soul, the heavenly soul departed, and all you have is something which is bereft of its spiritual half, of its goodness, and that is impurity. And therefore, the the Kohen, who embodies the spiritual side, he cannot come too close to something which has had the spiritual part of it withdrawn. Now, it's important to note, and the Chinuch adds this, that when someone is a total tzaddik, the Talmud tells us that when they die, their body does not transmit impurity. Why? Because the essence of a tzaddik is someone that has, you know, during the lifetime, when the hybrid was effective, when the body and soul were fused together, the tzaddik is someone, the righteous person is someone who has used the force of the soul to influence the body. And therefore, the body itself becomes elevated. The body itself is no longer animalistic. It too becomes angelic. It too becomes spiritual. In fact, there is an ancient custom for us to go pray at the grave sites of the righteous. Now, of course, at someone's grave, what's buried there? It's not their soul. Maybe on a kind of Kabbalistic level, the soul is hovering somewhere near. But it's the body. So why would you go pray at the venue of the body of the righteous? The answer is, is that a tzaddik is someone whose holiness, whose greatness is manifested specifically in their body because the soul, well, soul's holy regardless. The tzaddik is someone who's taken the soul and used it to infuse holiness into the body as well. And therefore, the body itself is transformed into an element of holiness. So that's the introduction to the Parsha. A coin can I come into contact with uh, with, a, with a dead body, with several exceptions. The first exception, what she tells us, is if there is a met mitzvah, if there is a dead body, a cadaver, a corpse that has no one to bury it, then the laws of not coming to, into contact, not contracting impurity go out the window, and the Kohen must bury the dead body right away. In addition, we're in verse 2 through 4, there are seven relatives to whom a Kohen can become impure, and that is a father, mother, sister, brother, unmarried sister, that is, son, daughter, and wife. Those are the seven relatives that a Kohen, when they die, can participate in the funeral, can mourn, and can indeed become impure by participating in the post-mortem activities of death, of burial, and of mourning. And in fact, the halacha states that if they refuse to mourn, if they say, you know what, I don't want to go to my brother or my father's funeral, they indeed are forced to do it. The Talmud tells us a story. There was a Kohen whose 
wife died the day before Pesach, and he, of course, wanted to participate in the Pesach sacrifice, and therefore he said, I'm not going to the funeral, and the sages and the rest of the priestly class, they forced him to go because it's a mitzvah, in fact, for someone to mourn over the death of their relative. And in fact, in this verse, the Rambam understands it's a, it's a mitzvah from the Torah, Torah-Idic mitzvah, to mourn deceased relatives. And of course, when someone mourns the death of a loved one in, in Judaism, it's, it's about dwelling on the pain and the sadness, but also it's to ruminate on the loss and try to figure out what the message is. Everything that we, that happens to us, we're trained to understand as a message from God. So even when tragedy strikes, of course, there's, there's pain, but the pain has to be channeled or ought to be an ideal world channeled to try to use it to, to improve yourself. And therefore, when a sad event happens, someone, someone's close relative dies, the mitzvah in the Torah is to try to awaken via the pain itself, the pain of the mourning, via the pain of the suffering to try to awaken with ourselves, okay, what can I do now to improve myself? What lesson can I absorb? What can I adopt to improve my ways, to improve my character, and to take something positive out of this terrible tragedy? So, these are the seven relatives that a coin, a regular coin, this is a standard coin, not the high priest, not the coin gadol. A regular coin can come into contact uh, with the deceased of these seven relatives, uh, provided that this was done, the marriage was done properly. So verse 4, we read, if the marriage was improper, it was against the laws of the Kohen to marry this person, then they cannot uh, contaminate themselves to that deceased relatives. Uh, but they should not, sometimes when people mourn, they like to self-flagellate. And then here we read verse 5, don't make a bald spot on their head, don't uh, shave their uh, their edge of their beard, and don't uh, gash themselves, don't deliberately cause themselves a wound. That's not how we mourn. We don't mourn in that way. We're holy to God. And by the way, Rashi tells us this does not apply only to a Kohen. It applies to all Jews, but it's repeated here to reinforce the idea that when we mourn over the dead, we do it in, in the proper way. We, we reflect, but we don't necessarily manifest it by flagellating ourselves, by causing us uh, wounds. And then we read in verse 7, who a Cohen can marry. He is not allowed to marry a Zona. Zona is a woman um, who behaves improperly, uh, sexually. It's a harlot, and the Talmud tells us a, a, um, a variety of different things that a woman could do to make herself a halachic Zona, what's called. He cannot marry a divorcee. So if the woman's been married and she was divorced, then he cannot he cannot marry her again. You shall sanctify him, for he offers the food of your God. He shall remain holy to you. Rashi tells us what this means is that the uh, the laws governing who a coin can and cannot marry those are compulsory meaning if a coin does marry a divorcee even though the marriage is considered halakhically valid there is an obligation for him to divorce that woman so if he doesn't want to do it he's forced to do it and this is interesting because we know we've read throughout Leviticus that there's certain there's many relationships that are prohibited but the Talmud tells us that there's different gradients of that relationship, of forbidden relationships. There are some that the relationship is so severe that even if they try to get married, that marriage is null and void. It doesn't actually activate. Whereas if there's a lower level of a prohibited relationship and they try to get married, the marriage works, but it's a marriage in sin. So if a Cohen wants to marry a divorcee, And they try to do it even though it's prohibited. If they do it, they are considered halakhically married and they would need to have a a divorce. Whereas, you know, random case, a a man tries to marry his sister and they do everything in a marriage ceremony, that marriage is not valid and therefore there's no need for a divorce because the marriage does not actually, uh, does not actually activate from a halakhic perspective. Another law we see here in uh, verse 8, Rashi tells us that the Kohen gets preferential treatment, meaning if there is um, the alias, right? We read from the Torah. Who gets the first uh, call to read from the Torah? That, of course, is the coin. If we're doing a, a zimun, we ate together, and now we have to lead the Berkat Amazon services, we have the Kohen do that. Every area of holiness, the Kohen gets preferential treatment. He goes first. However, the Talmud in several places, notably in the book of Horius, uh, page 13a, tells us the interesting question. What if you have a Kohen, even a Kohen adult, a high priest, 
but he's in ignoramus. He knows no Torah. And then you have the mamzer, the bastard, which of course is the lowest level of our social strata, but he's a great Torah scholar. Which one of them gets to go first? The Talmud tells us, quotes a verse in the book of Proverbs, Yikara hi mipninim, Torah is more precious than pininim, which means pearls. And the Talmud explains that means the Torah is more precious than the high priest who enters lifnai velifnim, which means the Talmud understands in this homiletic fashion that pininim, even though it technically means pearls, it also can be read as the inner sanctums, meaning the Torah is more precious than the high priest who enters the most inner sanctums of the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur. Torah is the great equalizer. Torah is the ability for people to earn their status on their own. And therefore, if you have a, a mamzer, a bastard, but he's a great Torah scholar, he comes ahead of the high priest who is an ignoramus. There's a similar teaching elsewhere in the Talmud. A note, for example, Avodazar 3a, I think it's also in Sanhedrin in 59. It tells us what happens if you have a Gentile. A Gentile studies Torah. So even though there's parts of Torah that a Gentile shall not study, but there are parts of Torah that a Gentile should, should study. What if a Gentile studies Torah? So the Talmud says, if a Gentile studies Torah, they are like the high priest. And quotes the same verse, Yikari Mepninim, Torah is more precious than pearls. Torah is more precious than the high priest entering the Holy of Holies. An amazing insight that even though you know, we can choose to what family we're born to, but we can choose what we do with our time here. And Torah is the way for us to catapult ourselves to the highest level of greatness, even superseding the high priest. Now, part of the laws here we read in, in chapter 21 of the Kohen is that if a daughter of a Kohen commits adultery, the method of execution, we know adultery by Torah law is a capital offense, and the, the method of execution is different for the daughter of a Kohen because they're from the higher stature, therefore their sin is a little bit more severe, and therefore the punishment is a little bit more severe as well. So those are the laws of a regular standard Kohen. And then we read about the laws of the high priest, the Kohen adult. He is more exalted than his brethren. He has the special anointment oil poured over his head. He wears the special garments of the high priest. And therefore, he has to mourn in an entirely different way. When his relative dies, cannot become impure, cannot rend his garments, cannot allow his hair to grow long. He cannot allow himself to look unkempt. He cannot become impure to anyone with the exception of a mit mitzvah, with the exception of a body that has no one to bury it. His father dies, his mother dies, brother, sister, wife, son, daughter, God forbid, they die. He cannot leave the Holy of Holies. He cannot make himself impure. No matter what, he has to re- remain in the sanctuary. He cannot defile himself and become impure. Now, there's an amazing nuance here in the commentaries in the, in the Kliyakar. He points out, if you read the verses here, when it lists the people that a high priest cannot become impure to, it says his father or his mother. So who comes first? The father. If you go back to the beginning of the chapter, when it lists the people that a regular coin can become impure to, it switches the order. He can become impure to his mother and to his father. So why in verse 2, when it talks about the people that a regular coin can become impure, does it say the mother first and then the father? And then in verse 11, when it lists the people that a high priest cannot become impure to, it lists it the other way around, his father or his mother. So the Kliakra says something very fascinating. He says each one of these verses accentuates the lesson. How so? Well, if you have a Kohen, we know for sure that his father is also a Kohen. Well, what about his mother? Well, it depends. Sometimes she could be from the family of a Kohen. Sometimes she could not be from the family of a Kohen. We don't know. And therefore, if we're saying that the Kohen can become impure, to his mother, which one of those is a more novel insight? It's a more novel insight to say that even though his mother is not from the family of the Kohen, still she becomes like a Kohen by marrying the Kohen, and therefore her son can become impure by attending her funeral. And therefore it says mother, then father, because that's the more novel insight. Whereas in verse 11, when it says that the high priest cannot become impure, even to his father, even to his father who definitely is a Kohen, 
he cannot become impure. His mother, well, that's less of an insight, and therefore it says the father first and then the mother. Really interesting nuance picked up here by the Kliyakar. Now, why can't a high priest become impure? It's an interesting question here. We know the, the regular Kohen can. So the Chinuch, the Sefer Chinuch, he explains that a regular Kohen, the Torah has mercy on him. These are close relatives. Let him go and pour at his heart in the uh, in mourning their lost relative. However, a high priest, what's their role? They're close to God. They're cleaving to God, and therefore, to a certain degree, they become dissociated from this world. They elevate themselves closer to God, and consequently, and almost by natural extension, they distance themselves from this world, and even from their family, even from their society. They become designated for holiness, and they become divorced, so to speak, from this world. And therefore, the high priest is someone that's a little bit more removed from his family, and therefore he's designated for God. He does not become impure by even a close relative's funeral. And there's another point here, and that is the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, he has to demonstrate that there's nothing more important than his role. His role as the almost the intermediate between Jewish people and God. He's the leader of the Jewish people. That role supersedes his identity as an individual, as part of a family. And in fact, this extends elsewhere to other principles in, 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 in Jewish law, namely the idea of a Nazir. A Nazir is someone who, for a certain amount of time, 30 days typically, designates themselves for holiness, and therefore, by designating yourself for this, you're removing yourself from that. And that extends also to, to Torah study, the Talmud tells a great story about one of the rabbis sent his kid to go study Torah. And he found out that instead of studying Torah, the child was doing all kinds of acts of kindness, of chesed. And he said to him, no, 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 I sent you not to go bury the dead, not to go give food to the needy. I sent you to go st- study Torah, and that has to supersede everything else. Similarly over here with the Kohen Gadol, he is designated for holiness, and he has a role at the head of the Jewish people, and that has to supersede everything else, even the close familial relationships that he has or that he had at a much higher level before he was nominated to become the high priest. The Talmud does entertain the possibility that he may be able to follow the funeral procession at a distance, but for sure everyone agrees that he cannot come into close contact or halachic contact with the deceased relative and become impure. Now, whereas a regular priest can marry a widow, we read here in verse 13, he shall marry a woman in her virginity. He is not allowed to marry a widow. He's not allowed to marry a divorcee. He's not allowed to marry a a desecrated woman, which is a woman to whom a coin was not allowed to be with, or their daughter. He's not allowed to marry a harlot. Only a virgin amongst his people shall he take for a wife. So he has to marry a virgin. He cannot marry a widow. The Talmud gives us an interesting law. What happens if a high priest previously wasn't a high priest? Every high priest starts off as a regular priest. The regular priest is engaged, is betrothed to a widow. And then before he fully marries her, he was nominated to become the high priest. You would think maybe he would not be allowed to marry her, but the answer is because he betrothed her, because On a transactional level, they're already married. She gets, so to speak, grandfathered in, and he's allowed to stay with her. And then we read some other laws related to uh, a Kohen. There are certain blemishes that would invalidate, would disqualify Kohen from doing work in the temple. Not from eating the special Kohen food, but from doing work in the temple. A Kohen who does work in the temple has to not only be spiritually representative of the role of the Kohen, but also on a physical level, they have to look the part. They cannot have any one of these deformities or blemishes that would disqualify them. So if you read the verse from chapter, from chapter 21, 16 through 24, it lists 12 different blemishes, but then it adds an inclusive verse that anyone has any blemishes really, they cannot offer sacrifices, they cannot do work, they cannot do work in the temple, in the tabernacle. 
the Rambam, he makes a list of 140 different blemishes that would disqualify a Kohen. Now, some of these blemishes are temporary, and once they're fixed, then once again, they are qualified. And this is, I think, an interesting thing to, to ruminate upon, that, you know, we do focus on the spiritual, and not necessarily the physical, and we even train to eschew the physical, yet somehow, regarding work in the temple, the people who are injured, the people who are disfigured, God forbid, the people who are disabled, God forbid, those people are, so to speak, discriminated against. And it's an interesting point to ponder, you know, why would, you know, if we're worried just about the spiritual, why does someone's physical deformities, why does that disqualify them? And I think the answer is because the essence of the Mishnah, the essence of the tabernacle is a fusion. It's taking the physical and making it spiritual. It's the touch point of these two worlds. And consequently, maybe we could say that because this is the arena for elevating the physical, the physical itself takes on the status, the state of the spiritual, and therefore a physical deformity in the temple itself really equals a spiritual deformity as well. Just an idea uh, to think about. Uh, the Talmud does say, incidentally, a great story with Rabbi Yoshua. Uh, he argued that for a Torah scholar, it's actually better for them to be deformed or better for them to be ugly. Whereas some he- somehow over here it's different with respect to the priesthood, they have to be perfect physically as well. Okay, so that's chapter 21. Let's begin chapter 22. It begins, speak to Aaron to his sons, and they shall withdraw from the holies of the children of Israel, that which they sanctify me, so as to not desecrate my holy name, I am Hashem. So these are a restriction, these are warnings against a priest participating in sacrifices during their periods of impurity. In the event that a coin does become impure, hopefully it was not done as a result of their own decision, they need to become pure, and once they purify, then they can do sacrifices, then they can eat the foods of the Kohen, but beforehand, they are not allowed to do that. Now, there are a whole class of foods that are only consumable by a Kohen. Part of them are, let's say, uh, the, turu- the truma, which is essentially a tax, a priest tax, that is levied upon the entire Jewish nation. If you have a, a field, you have an orchard, and you yield a, a, a produce a bounty, you have to give a certain percentage of that to the Levite, a certain percentage of that to the Kohen, and the part that's given to the Kohen is around 2%. That is only allowed to be eaten by a Kohen. So if I'm a Kohen, I give it to my children, because they're also a Kohen, and of course to my wife as well, even if she originally, her pedigree is not of a Kohen, she joins the Kohanic tribe by marrying the Kohen. But then in verse 10 and verse 11, we talk about what if the, you know, what about the extended members of a Kohen household? So the halacha is that if a Kohen has a slave and the slave is a Jewish slave, because he's not permanently part of the household, he cannot consume the truma as a Kohen. Whereas if someone has a non-Jewish slave, because he's permanently part of the household, they are included in the broader household of the Kohen and therefore they can indeed eat from the truma. What if a Kohen has a daughter? So she, of course, before she's married, she's allowed to eat truma. She's part of the family. But then she marries out. And she doesn't marry a fellow Kohen. She marries a regular Israelite. So then, because she goes into the household of the Israelite, she cannot eat from the truma in her father's household because now she's part of a new household. Whereas if she gets divorced or she's widowed, then it depends. If she has children from the Israelite, then she's still part of the Israelite tribe. Whereas if she's widowed or divorced without any children, she can go back to her father's household and participate in the truma as she did before she got married. And then we read about blemishes, not in the priests, not in the humans, but in the animals. Hashem's what to Moses is saying, speak to Aaron and to his sons and to all the children of Israel and say to them, a man of the house of Israel and of the proselytes among children of Israel will bring an offering of any of the vows, the free will offerings, various kinds of offerings, Rashi tells us. There's different different syntax that you would say to make different classifications of offerings. When you bring the offering, it has to be unblemished. It has to be male from the cattle, from the flock, and from the goats. 
So this is another halacha, another law here, that if you are bringing a sacrifice, it has to be from, and it's an ola sacrifice, it has to be from an unblemished male animal. And there's an interesting dilemma, well, you know, what if the blemished animal, it's a minor blemish, but it's a very healthy, a very robust animal, and the unblemished animal is small, is scrawny, is frail, well, which one do you choose then? And the answer is you still go with the unblemished animal. And this may be, uh, may be an answer to an interesting question. In, in our pursuit of greatness, there's two kinds of greatness. There's greatness in one area, but someone being let's say, average in other areas. And then there's someone who has perfection. Not necessarily as, not standing out so much in one area, but kind of being a jack of all trades, being good in all areas, not having any flaws. Which one of them is better? So here it seems to indicate that in a in a showdown between greatness versus perfection, perfection would triumph. Being unblemished is better than being blemished in one area, but sensational, fantastic, off the charts in another area. So then it lists uh, the various kinds of blemishes that would disqualify an animal for being offered as a sacrifice. And of course, this is an impartial list. The Ramah lists many, 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 many different blemishes and imperfections that would disqualify an animal. And then in verse 24, we read an interesting law. One whose uh, testicles are squeezed, crushed, torn, or cut. So if the animal has its testicles are injured, that you don't offer at, to Hashem. And then it adds nor shall you do these in your land. So this little addendum tells us that this is a prohibition of the Torah, not in the context of sacrifices, but even in the land that we're not allowed to spay or to neuter or to castrate any animal, even a non-kosher animal. So this, this idea here is that we cannot disrupt what God is doing. God wants the world to have continuity and all the species that he created to perpetuate and therefore we cannot take actions that would limit the animal species from flourishing. So I think included in this would be not to poach endangered species because if they're at a risk of going extinct, that would be included in this in this general concept. Now if someone wants to buy a pet, the solution here is to buy a pet that's already been neutered, already been spayed, and therefore not do it yourself. If someone else does it, it's not a problem. And the commentaries tell us that this actually extends to people as well. This would be a prohibition for a man to have a vasectomy or for a woman to get her tubes tied. This would be a prohibition of the Torah to permanently disable fertility. Uh, there's a big issue what to do with birth control, uh, the halachic parameters of birth control is a complicated question, but it has to be done in accordance with with Torah laws. There are parameters, there are halakhic parameters, how to do birth control, what methods are better, what methods are worse, etc. That's a complicated question uh, for uh, for further discussion. And then verse 25 we read, this is an interesting verse because it extends the concept of sacrifices not just to Jews but to non-Jews as well. From the hand of the stranger, you may now offer the food of your God for many of these for their corruptions is in them, blemishes in them, and they will not favor find favor for you. So Rashi tells us that this teaches us, or you can imply from this verse, that we cannot accept sacrifices from non-Jews that have blemishes. But of course, it's implied from that, that if the animal does not have blemishes, then you can indeed accept sacrifices from non-Jews. The temple, the tabernacle, we we say in scripture, Beiti, Beit Filei Karel Cholamim, my house, God says, is going to be a house of prayer for all the nations. It's not just for the Jews, it's for all the nations. That said, there are some differences in the sacrifices of non-Jews versus Jews, notably that a non-Jew can only o- offer, an Ola offering can only offer a sacrifice that is entirely burned on the pyre on the altar. It cannot be, let's say, a shlaman, which is eaten by people, the Kohen, the, the owner, etc. There's a famous story in the book of Gittin related to Kamtsa and Bar Kamtsa. It tells of a sacrifice that was offered from the Caesar to the temple but some guy sabotaged it 
to create friction, to create disharmony between the Jews and the Romans, and deliberately made a blemish, but a blemish that was insignificant in the eyes of the non-Jews, but still would be invalidated, uh, that, that would still invalidate it from being offered a sacrifice in the temple, and that was a way to create disharmony between the Jews and their Roman overlords. Really interesting story, really tragic story of the events that led to the revolt of the Jews and eventually to the destruction of the temple and the decimation of Judea in the first century of the Common Era. Okay, so verse 26, we read about a new law. Hashem spoke to Moses, when an ox or a sheep or a goat is born, it shall remain under its mother for seven days. And from the eighth day on, is it acceptable as a sacrifice? So if you have a, a baby animal, it's less, than t- it's less than eight days old, it cannot be offered as a sacrifice. And the reason for this is because prior to that, it is less desirable. You won't want to eat an animal that is that young. It's too tender. It's not, it's not, it's not advanced enough. It's not mature enough to be desirous. And therefore we do not give our leftovers. We do not give our suboptimal animals as a sacrifice. When we do a mitzvah, we do it in the most choicest fashion possible. I know in Houston, we had a huge hurricane a couple of years ago, and many people from all over the world and all over the country gave all kinds of donations of all kinds of stuff to the community that was affected. And I noticed there were some people and some organizations that kind of took their grade B stuff and just shipped them off to Houston. And others, they say, no, we're going to give our best stuff because it's a mitzvah. And we don't want to just give the, you know, the, 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 the lower grade stuff for the mitzvah. We want to do the best. And that's the idea over here that when someone brings a sacrifice, it should not be the, the scrawny animal. It should not be the blemished animal. It shouldn't be the animal that is less desirable because it's too young and too frail. And then there's another mitzvah here in verse 28 that if you are offering a sacrifice or even if you're not offering a sacrifice, if you're consuming an animal, you cannot kill the mother and the baby in the same day. So if you want to offer a sacrifice to the mom and the baby, you have to do it on separate days. But even if you want to have a steak and you have the mother cow and the baby calf, you have to wait a day between killing the mother and the baby. We believe that the Almighty gave animals for us to enjoy. So we're not opposed to consumption of animals for our own pleasure, for our own enjoyment. However, we don't do the mother and the baby on the same day. What's the reason for this? So the Sefer Chinuch tells us two different reasons. He says, number one, that we believe that the Almighty gives us oversight, direct oversight, what's known as divine providence, hashtach the Almighty oversees what happens to us on an individual level. What about animals? Does the Almighty oversee my puppy the same way he oversees my child? And the answer is no. Humans have an individual oversight. Animals have a species-wide oversight. And therefore, just like the Almighty oversees, wants the species to have continuity, we too should not take actions that seem to have within it a scintilla of destruction of species. Therefore, we have the mother and the baby. We don't come on the same day to kind of remember this point. That's the first idea that he suggests, why we don't kill the mother and the baby on one day. Alternatively, he tells us that the reason why we do that, the reason why we refrain from killing the mother and the baby on the same day is to not breed cruelty. It's to breed instead benevolence and mercy. Of course, the, the Torah wants us to be merciful, to be to be merciful people, and therefore by withholding from killing the mother and baby, that will hopefully instill within us the characteristic of mercy. And then in verse 32, a very important verse, not to say that there's a hierarchy of verses, but a very important concept in in Jewish life, do not desecrate God's holy name, rather God should be sanctified amongst the children of Israel, I am Hashem who sanctifies you. This is the idea of what's called Kiddush Hashem, sanctification of God's name. Alternatively, the flip side of that is desecration of God's name, when the Rambam gives us his laws, the laws, which is essentially the complete, unabridged version of all of Jewish laws, he lists the laws in order of importance. And the very first four chapters are about the belief in God. What's chapter five? What's the first thing he tells us after the Rambam's 
explication of theology. What's the first thing he tells us? What's the first mitzvah he discusses after belief in God? The mitzvah of sanctifying God's name and not desecrating it. Of course, these are general concepts. Anything that you do to promote, so to speak, the existence of God in this world is sanctification of God's name. And conversely, God forbid, if someone were to do the opposite, that is, again, the most severe the flip side, the counterweight of sanctifying God's name is desecrating God's name. Now, specifically what that means is, uh, the most literal fulfillment of that is in the event where someone puts a gun to your head and says, bow down to the idol, or I kill you, we bite the bullet, we accept the, our fate, we give up our life in order to sanctify God's name. And now, of course, if it was a different sin, then it would be different. If someone says, okay, eat the cheeseburger, it's not kosher, even though it's prohibited, we do do that in order to save a life. But there's the three cardinal sins, idolatry, adultery, and murder. We don't do them even if it means forfeiting our lives. That's chapter 22. Chapter 23 contains within it all the festivals. Hashem spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, Hashem has appointed festivals that you are are designated for me as holy convocations. These are my festivals. And what's the first festival that it tells us? It tells us six days work shall be done on the seventh day is a day of complete rest, a holy convocation. Don't do any work. It is a Sabbath for Hashem in all your dwelling places. If it's going to list for us the festivals, why does it begin with the weekly Shabbos? So Rashi tells us that if you keep the festivals, it's like you keep Shabbos and vice versa. You keep the Shabbos you, as if you keep the festivals. That's what it says, says to us. So the Ramban, he elaborates on this point and he adds another, an, another, another insight. Of course, we're supposed to celebrate the festivals. And festivals are different than Shabbos, even though all festivals we cannot do malach, we cannot do work, just like we can't do on Shabbos. But there are some categories of work that we can do during the festivals. For example, cooking. We're allowed to cook. We're allowed to carry. We're allowed to carry from one domain to another domain on a festival. So provided that certain qualifications, certain circumstances are fulfilled. However, those don't override Shabbos. So let's say you have a festival and Shabbos coinciding. The laws of Shabbos have to override the laws of the festivals and you would not be able to cook on the festival because of the Shabbos half of that day. Even though on a normal festival, if it was on a Tuesday or whatever, you would be allowed to cook. Okay, so that's the the first thing we read about over here. And Rashi tells us in verse 4 that there is a responsibility not just to the Jewish individuals but the Jewish nation, the Jewish court system to number one – harmonize the solar year and the lunar month. We follow a solar yearly cycle, an annual solar cycle, 365 and a quarter days. And we follow a lunar monthly cycle. And that means that every two or three years, we have to add an additional month to harmonize those two. In addition, we have to also appoint every month because a lunar month is roughly 29 days 12 hours, 44 minutes, and a little bit more than three seconds, that means that every lunar month will be either, will either skew lower and it'll be 29 day month, or it will skew longer, it'll be a 30 day month. So those responsibilities of maintaining the Jewish calendar is included here in the general broad calendar that we see in the Jewish world, in the festivals, and uh, the month by month cycle that we follow. Okay, so it begins with Pesach. And of course, the first day of Pesach is a festival. The last day of Pesach is also a festival. And the intermediate days are also Pesach. But it's not days that we are not allowed to do work. And it talks to us about the eating matzah. If you eat matzah for seven days. And the first and the last day are days of, of a festival in which you cannot do work. Now, of course, the matzah is the symbolism of the festival because the matzah is a symbolism of A, the affliction that we had in Egypt, and B, it's the bread of freedom. And therefore, that is the mitzvah of the festival to kind of highlight the transformation that we had. We were slaves to Pharaoh. We became slaves to God, but really we became free men because when someone's a slave to God, that is the ultimate freedom that someone can achieve. Now, verse 10, it tells us that on the second day of Pesach, which is the day after the first day of Pesach, 
we have to bring the Omer offering. It's a barley offering that is brought the second day of Pesach. That also begins a few things. Number one, the new grain is unlocked. So the new year's cycle of grain can be eaten after that point. But previously, you have to eat the previous year's uh, yield, the previous year's produce. That's number one. Number two, you begin the count towards Shavuot. We, right now, are amidst of the Sfirat Omer, and that is the bridge connecting Pesach to the next holiday of Shavuot, which, of course, is the anniversary of when we got the Torah. That begins. We start counting on the second day of Pesach, which is the day in which we bring the Omer offering, the barley offering in the temple that uh, begins that count. And then we read in verse 15 about the count itself. And the Ramban tells us, interestingly, that there's, just like we have on Pesach, there's the first day of Pesach, which is a day of a festival. And then there's the last day of Pesach, which is also a festival. And then there's the intermediate days, which is kind of like, it, it is Pesach, but it's not a festival. Similarly, we have a bigger example of that. You have Pesach itself, and they have Shavuos 50 days later, and then the days of the Omer, the counting of the Omer, are the bridge between, the, they're like the intermediate days connecting these two festivals. And there's, of course, an intimate connection between the Exodus that happened on Pesach, that happened on Passover, and the Mount Sinai experience when we got the Torah, which happened on Shavuot. Pesach, of course, is about liberation, but it's most notably liberation from slavery to being free, free men, and that's physical liberation. And on Shavuot, we get the Torah, and the Torah is all about spiritual liberation. So there's an intimate connection connecting the festival of Passover, of Pesach, and the festival of Shavuot. And those are bridged, those are linked together via the counting of the Omer. It's also been pointed out that the Omer offering that we bring on the second day of Pesach is a barley offering. And on Shavuot, we bring another offering, which is called the Shtei Halachim, which is a wheat offering. And in Jewish literature, barley is always presented as the food of animals, whereas wheat is presented as the food of humans. And similarly, there's this continuity where via Torah, we're upgrading ourselves. Just like we spoke about earlier, that you know, man has the, the animalistic side. And it has the angelic side, the, the, the side, the, the, the other part, the, our soul. Similarly, with Torah, how do we kind of force this transformation? How do we uplift, upgrade, so to speak, our body into being holy? That's done via Torah. And therefore, on the day of the Torah, we bring the offering that is considered a human offering, human food, the, the wheat, so to speak, which is distancing ourselves from their animalistic side and focusing on our soul. And that, of course, is unlocked via Torah. Now, it is interesting, you know, we have the the trope of someone who is in prison counting down the days. And therefore, you would think if we're counting the days till Shavuos, we should be counting down. We just start with 49 and count down to 48, 40, 47 days, 46 days, 35 days left until we have Shavuot. Yet we count up. The first day of counting, which is the second day of Pesach, is 1 and 2 and 3 and then 49 and then eventually 50. So why do we count up and not count down? So there's several answers. Number one, we know that every event in the Jewish calendar repeats itself from year to year. So Rosh Hashanah is the first day of uh, of, of, of mankind and therefore we, we relive that. And Yom Kippur and, and Sukkot and, and Pesach, of course, we're reliving what events triggered those festivals. Jewish people leave Egypt on Passover, and they have no idea how many days they have left until they get the Torah, so they start counting. How many days? Okay, day one, day two, day three. And they're building towards something. It's cumulative. Each day, they're preparing, and each day, they're readying themselves towards the receiving of the Torah. So that's the counting of the Omer, bridging Pesach and Shavuot. And then it talks about Shavuot itself, And it's interesting, it presents it as a day of reaping of the harvest, and even though we know that it's the anniversary of giving of the Torah, it's actually not labeled like that explicitly in in the Torah. So why not? Why does it not actually label it? We have to do the math ourselves. We know, of course, the the Exodus corresponds to the Exodus, and and that's Pesach. And we know Shavuos corresponds to the Mount Sinai experience, but it doesn't explicitly say that in the Torah. 
So the Kliyakar, he says something very fascinating. He says that when someone studies Torah, every time you study Torah, it's considered as if you're, ba- you're at Mount Sinai again. It's another revelation. It's another experience. You're at Sinai anew every single day. And therefore, it will be improper to label one specific day of the calendar, one out of 365 days. That's the day of, the, of a chapter in the Torah. No. Every time you sit down and study Torah, it creates a newness and it creates another modicum, another measure of experience at Sinai. And it's interesting, the Shteh HaLechem, the wheat offering that we bring on on Shavuot, on the day we got the, we got we got the Torah that is made out of chametz, out of leavened bread, and in Jewish literature, leavened bread is always synonymous with the Yetzirah, with evil inclination. And the reason why, specifically on the day that we got the Torah, we bring a sacrifice, uh, an offering in the temple of of chametz, of leavened bread. It's to tell you that when someone has Torah. That's like a blanket shield against the evil inclination. And therefore, it's okay to have a little bit of chametz. It's okay to have a little bit of leavened bread, which represents, which symbolizes the, the eights of the evil inclination, because this is, they got Torah. And therefore, when you have Torah, you become impervious to the eights of hara. And then verse 22, like right smack in the middle of talking about the various holidays, we talked about about Pesach, we talk about the, the Omer, we talk about Shavuos, we're about to talk about Rosh Hashanah, and it interjects with the laws of Leket Shekhan the laws that we said last week, namely that you cannot reap all your, your whole field, you have to leave the gleanings of your harvest to the poor people, and then it goes right back to talking about Rosh Hashanah. So there's two questions. Number one, why does it repeat it? We read it out last week, why does it need to repeat it again? And specifically, why is it repeated over here? So Rashi tells us that it's repeated to tell you that there's two separate mitzvahs, it's a very severe thing. And why is it repeated over here? Because there's a certain connection between the festivals and giving charity, being generous to poor people. And Rashi tells us why, that if you give the gleanings, the corner of your field, the, the, the items that you forgot, the, 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 the starts that you forgot to the, to the poor person, it's as if you built a temple, you offered sacrifices, Inside of it, there's a certain connection between charity and the sacrifices and the festivals. And I think the simplest understanding is that all these are about faith. When someone, of course, goes to the temple, someone offers a sacrifice. When someone has a festival, that is about recognizing that God exists and I have to do something about it. I have to recognize it. Similarly, when someone offers charity, they realize, of course, that God owns everything, but he wants me to be his partner and to give charity to the people that are less fortunate than ourselves, and therefore there's a connection between charity and between the holidays and between the sacrifices and between the temple and faith. That's an interesting idea. The Sephardo tells us something uh, as well. He points out that on Shavuos, it talks about the harvest. That's when you actually bring in the harvest. And then it right away transitions to charity. And he tells us a very deep insight. You just had your harvest. This is where the whole year's work is being reaped. You have income now. What do you do? How do you make sure that you preserve it? How do you not lose it? What's the key after you have income to not lose it? Give charity. Charity is the preservative to wealth. Another very powerful insight idea. Okay, so it moves on now to Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, of course, is the birthday of man, and therefore it's the birthday of God's kingdom, and therefore it's the day of judgment. The Ramban tells us that the Rosh Hashanah is a day of judgment sprinkled with mercy. Whereas Yom Kippur, it's the opposite. It's a day of mercy sprinkled with judgment. It's been suggested that there is a universal custom to eat apples on Rosh Hashanah. Perhaps the reason is uh, an apple. You have a red apple. What do you have? You have a red on the outside and white on the inside. You have a little bit of judgment. The red is emblematic of judgment. And then the white on the inside, that's emblematic of mercy. It's a mixture of the two. And maybe to highlight that, that's why we eat apples on Rosh Hashanah. And then it talks about Yom Kippur and, and Sukkot. And on Yom Kippur, we have the five torments that we do. Yom Kippur is the day of atonement, but it only atones if you repent. And the 
Torah tells us that we have to torment ourselves with five different ways and not to eat or drink, not to wash, not to smear ourselves with oil, not to wear shoes, and not to engage in marital intercourse. And these five correspond, the term five appears many times in relation to Yom Kippur. Five times it says your soul in this section. Five times uh, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, immerses himself in the mikvah on, on Yom Kippur. There's five prayers, the only day a year that we have five prayers. And the, the tour adds that the soul is comprised of five parts. And therefore, there's five things that we do to torment ourselves on Yom Kippur to be able to weaken, so to speak, our bodily vice that it has on us and to accentuate our soul. And then it talks about Sukkot and Shemini Yatzeres. This is, again, a, a seven-day holiday with one day added at the end. And Rashi tells us very powerful. It tells us that you have a king who invited his son to a party, and the party's over, and he says, okay, I need one more day. I can't, can't allow you to leave. It's very difficult for me to leave. Your departure is difficult for me. Stay for one more day, and that's the last day of Kol Shemini Yatzeres. That last day to cement the relationship that we have with God and only then could we depart for the winter. And it also tells us with respect to Sukkot that it's a day of celebration. It's a day of joy. It says the Talmud, what does that mean? How do you fulfill this mitzvah to be joyous on the festival? It means to eat meat and wine, and it means to give clothing and jewelry for the women. This mitzvah applies not only on the festival of Sukkot, it applies in all the festivals. Why is our joy, why is our happiness stressed specifically on Sukkot? So maybe the answer is because Sukkot comes right after Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur were cleansed from sin and therefore were naturally inclined to be joyous. We read about the four species that we bring on Sukkot. And of course, we have to sit in a sukkah for seven days. For seven days, we leave our permanent dwelling and we move into a temporary dwelling. And of course, hopefully that will remind us that really our whole life over here is one of a temporary existence. Chapter 24 begins with the menorah. You light the menorah each night. We read about the lechem upon him, the showbread that is put on to the table. You have 12 breads. These are breads which are actually kosher for Passover. They're very uniquely shaped. They're shaped like a boat. you got walls coming up on both sides. And in fact, if you study the nature of these breads, each loaf was about three feet long and a foot and a half wide and a half a foot tall. They're huge. The Talmud gives us a great story about the family that knew how to actually produce this in the best best fashion. There was one family that was experts at doing it. No one seemed to be able to bake the bread as professionally as they did. But because they did not want to share their secrets with the other families, they were reprimanded. They were disgraced as a result of that. And then we read about the blasphemer, verse 10 of chapter 24. The son of an Israelite woman went out and he was a son of an Egyptian man. Among the children of Israel, they fought in the camp the son of the Israelite woman and the Israelite man. And the son of the Israelite woman pronounced the name and blasphemed. So they brought him to Moses and his mother's name was Shlomis Bastivri from the tribe of Dan. And they put him under guard to clarify what to do with him. Very interesting story. We have this blasphemer and a unique background. His mother is Jewish and his father is Egyptian. But the section begins, he went out, he departed. So what does Rashi say? Rashi says, Three reasons what it means that he departed. What did he depart from? So according to the first opinion is he departed from his world. His true identity, his true self is his soul. And because this person blasphemed, because he committed this horrific sin, he abandoned his true self. That's the first opinion. Second opinion is that he departed from the section that we just talked about, namely that of the showbreads. He said, hey, you're going to have these showbreads that they're existing for a whole week. You're giving God weak old bread. Thirdly, what happened was, and this relates to the background of this individual, he, because his father was a non-Jew, his father was an Egyptian man who had raped a Jewish woman, he didn't have an identity in a tribe. He was Jewish, of course, because his mother was Jewish, but he wasn't part of the tribe because his father was not Jewish, and therefore there was no tribal affiliation. So he said, I'm going to go to the tribe of Dan. That's where my mother's from. And they said to him, okay, what are you doing here? Your father's not from the tribe of Dan. So he was kicked out. And he he was Jewish, but didn't have, he didn't have a place amongst the nation. So he went to Moses, and he says, "Okay, do I have a place amongst the Jewish people?" And he said, "I'm sorry, you're Jewish, but you don't you're not part of the tribes." And therefore, he got frustrated, and he 
blasphemed. Now, there's a very interesting pedigree here. Rashi tells us he's the son of an Egyptian man. Rashi points out all the way back in chapter 2 of the book of Exodus, Moses killed an Egyptian man. And says Rashi, this is the same Egyptian man. This, that man raped a Jewish woman, and this is his son. And therefore, he comes from a an unusual pedigree, unusual background. His father was not Jewish. And then Rashi tells us something very fascinating. He gives us his mother's name, Shlomit Bat Divri. Rashi tells us, this is not necessarily her actual name. Shlomit means shalom, from the word shalom. This woman, says Rashi, she was a flirtatious woman. She would say, hi, hi, shalom, shalom, shalom to everyone they met. And she was Bas Divri, the daughter of Divri. The word Divri means she was a speaker. She would schmooze with everyone. And therefore, because she because she was too friendly, because she engaged in too much levity with everyone, therefore, she flirted with people and she ended up in, in, a, in a poor situation and she ended up with a child of a non-Jew and all that caused this tremendous catastrophe that her son did not have a place and have an identity and he was ostracized and eventually he committed the horrific sin of blasphemy. But Rashi also tells us that it gives us the identity of this woman because she was the only one that behaved in this fashion amongst the whole nation, hundreds of thousands of people. There was only one woman that behaved in this way. And they brought him to Moses and eventually he was put under guard to clarify the matter. Rashi tells us that there was another individual, the Makoshish, the person who gathered the twigs on Shabbos, and he was also incarcerated, but they didn't incarcerate them Together, not all criminals are equal. We don't believe that you have, God forbid, a a, a rapist and then someone who steals uh, a a can uh, from the 7-Eleven. They're not put in the same cell together. Each criminal is treated as an individual. Eventually, he was executed. And I think it's important to point out that execution equals atonement because when someone commits a sin – and then they get punished for it, their sin is cleansed. For an example, past two weeks you read about there's someone who gives his kids to Molech. They take their child and they kill the child, child sacrifice to the idol Molech. So the halacha is that if someone kills one of their children, then they're executed for committing that heinous, macabre sin. Whereas if someone gives all of his children to Molech, he would think certainly they would get executed, but the law is no. Because their sin is too heinous for expiation, they're not executed. Because in Jewish law, execution is not, is not revenge. It is atonement. It's not even punishment. It's cleansing. And therefore, for someone who committed a ter- terrible sin, but they are executed in the Jewish court of law, they can now have a role in eternity. They can have a place in eternity because their sins have been cleansed. And the Parsha ends with uh, several more laws, the law of a murderer, the law of someone who injures another individual or or someone who kills or injures someone else's animal. And uh, thus concludes the law. Moses spoke to the children of Israel. It goes back to the story of the blasphemer. They took the blasphemer out of, outside of the camp and they executed him and they did exactly what the Almighty wanted of them. That's from Who's the Parsha. Hope you enjoyed. Thank you for listening. Email me, rabbiwolby at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you soon.